always this all cry. Do you ever wear your foot? I have some that are clear. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Freddie Weinstein. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Dominican Hospital in, in Santa Cruz, and I get to be the panel moderator for our last hour here. I'd um, like to start by, first of all, what do you guys think of the morning session? So uh, we'll, f we'll of course be welcoming back uh, Dr. Buchheimer, uh, as well as uh, Professor uh, Willie, uh, but we have two new uh, additional panel members joining. We have uh, Dr. Cheryl Bowers, uh, who's a local expert. <laughs> and we're also honored to be joined by uh, uh, Mr. George uh, Mellon, uh, who's a local resident uh, living on the spectrum. So we thought we'd maybe sort of kick off this, this last hour with uh, Mr. Mellon sort of sharing some thoughts uh, that he has, uh, maybe speak a little bit about uh, this morning or just some ideas he wanted to sort of get across to you in, in preparation. So, uh, Mr. Mellon? Um, everyone can hear me, right? Well, the thought that struck me that it's come up on other things when I've heard about how people talk about uh, people on the spectrum or what it's like on the spectrum or just things related to autism. And yeah, there are a lot of things about it that can be really difficult and really unpleasant. And but that's not what I'm here to talk about. You, everyone here knows that part. But it just strikes me that we talk about out as if it's something that we should. Uh, cure or treat or remedy or somehow or another as if it was something that if people become normal that would be the same as functional. <laughs> and well, I'm here, here to say as someone who is on the spectrum and someone who is at least able to act as if they're functional, I am not convinced of this theory. I don't like it. Deeply disturbing, actually, that it's presented as if, if being neurotypical as real, opposed to being uh, autistic is healthy and happy and you don't have this anxi anxiety that's going to attack you at any minute. Well, I'm definitely, I don't have even a single college class on, to my credit. I'm just an enthusiastic reader here. but. From what I know of how people think and how people deal with the world, no, that's not how it works. And I think that if, it, if uh, autism is, as far as how it produces anxiety and aggravation and frustration is treated as if dealing with it as a problem of you're different, then the less different you are, the better you'll be, I don't think that's going to help anyone. I think that there's a, I don't mean to wish anyone ill who's spoken about this, but just, it would be like if you found, if we had people who were capable of using psychic powers, and, but they also got a terrible headaches, and our solution was, let's get rid of the psychic powers, then they won't have headaches anymore. That would be perfectly happy. And we're just going to forget that normal people get headaches too. So I just feel that we need to remember this and we need to not just talk about how people on the spectrum can be better able to deal with the world, but how people not on the spectrum can be better able to deal with us. I just thought that had to be said. So thank you for listening to me there. All right, well, thank you. Uh, before we get to the questions, perhaps we can have um, uh, Dr. Bowers tell us a little bit about herself, about her practice here. Um, when we've put these panels together, we try to have our, our speakers as well as a local consumer and a local uh, uh, content expert, and so Dr. Bowers is uh, filling that role here, so. Thank you. Um, I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist, uh, so we share the same training, but uh, I did not go into research. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this panel today. It's, it's an absolute honor. It's just been a tremendous learning experience for me today. 
um, from, from everyone. And uh, I would like to also say that as a neuropsychologist, uh, my job is to um, help with both the diagnosis, but also the treatment planning and the life planning, and looking at where are we going from here and how do we build upon the strengths and the beauty that you bring to the world. And I so agree with what you said. We, we all have challenges, and we just look at these, each challenge individually to say, how can we make life better and richer for all of us? Um, I, and since I have the, the, the microphone for a minute, I'm also going to say that um, I'm a member of both the Monterey Bay Psychological Association and the California Psychological Association. Uh, I'm an officer on both of those boards. And um, this is a really powerful opportunity for us as a group today to know that um, there are legislators that want to hear from us. They want to hear from us as a unified group. Um, if everybody in this room were to uh, somehow communicate, I don't know how that could be possible, but if there was a way that anybody who wanted to, that was in this room today, to send an email to someone perhaps even me, saying, I want you to know who I am and what I'm doing in the world uh, to serve autism, that we would then have a one unified voice that we could take to our local legislators and say, hey, here's a group of people who want to see more done legislatively and financially for a, an underserved population. And uh, so I would encourage either someone on the someone <laughs> uh, to step up and uh, take that opportunity if they would. Um, but it's been great to see everyone here today and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. So the first question is one that we get every year, no matter what the topic is, if it's bullying, cyberbullying, depression, autism, um, and because of Santa Cruz, the, the role of medical marijuana. Um, in autism. Uh, I guess we could sort of expand on it a little bit, uh, maybe talk about the impact of substance abuse as, as either a form of self-medication or perhaps something that will trigger off or uh, unmask a genetic uh, predisposition. Uh, this was written to the entire panel, uh, but maybe uh, we can begin with uh, uh, Professor Willey uh, addressing that one. Or not? <laughs> or anyone want to take a first swing on it? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, so I, I happen to have strong and unusual feelings on this subject. First of all, there are no um, uh, controlled trials of um, marijuana in autism. There is no evidence to uh, suggest it is either good or bad. And uh, as a scientist, we always want to make sure that there are good randomized controlled trials before we make any recommendations for treatment. That said, marijuana has a um, peculiar effect on the developing brain. Uh, it is selectively affecting um, particularly neurons in the hippocampal area during development. It actually has much less of an effect after the brain is fully developed. Um, so if you start smoking pot when you're 25 or 26, you'll probably be okay later on in life as long as you don't overdo it. But if you smoke pot when you are uh, in, have a developing brain, there are lifelong and very serious consequences which are only now coming to light because the cohort that began smoking marijuana in the 60s is now aging. We've been studying these aging brains, and um, I will tell you, as uh, my other job is as an aging researcher, are shocked at the magnitude of the effect of marijuana on the developing brain. So I would um, say there is, first of all, there's no evidence in favor of marijuana uh, or against um, helping symptoms of autism. There's no evidence either way. But any uh, use of uh, marijuana products in the developing brain is extremely dangerous. and. Um, uh, it, it, I can't say anything about its use in adults, but that's, I would have extreme cautions about that. Other thoughts or comments on the topic from anyone? I would say as a person who indulged in both prescription and non-prescription medications, I feel much healthier, much safer, and much more moderated on prescription medications that go through my physician. So it's a no for me. Sorry. So several people um, had questions related to a topic that was touched upon briefly, and that had to do with sort of cultural differences in, in autism, uh, issues around frequency, uh, acceptance, and outcomes. I know it was touched upon, but perhaps maybe elaborating on how you would work with a family who, from a cultural standpoint, has difficulty uh, accepting uh, autism. 
Sure, I, um, you know, that, that's such a good question uh, about the cultural differences. And I think that part of the role of, for all of us, is educating the community to understand what, not just what is autism, but how does it affect your family and how does your family interact with your developing child or spouse um, to, to see to see autism as something that uh, goes across cultures, it goes across genders, it goes across economies, um, and that it's not so much a cultural difference as, as it is an individual difference and to help people look at it individually, but also from a cultural perspective to take away the fear um, that it might have a stigma attached to it and to make sure and educate people uh, so that they know more about A, what services are available, but also uh, to find the strengths of people without looking so much at um, uh, how that might uh, change. But I also need to, to recognize that in some cultures, um, having a psychiatric illness can be seen as, um, as, as perhaps something that someone else in the family has done wrong. Uh, and that's a big stigma to work against, but I think it's important to, to consider that when we're working with cultural differences. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, different versions of a question of sort of nature versus nurture and the impact of our obsessions with smartphones, video games, the use, the immersion in, in those types of technology, um, uh, whether sort of that being, you know, uh, a, a, a symptom or that could increase, symptomat increase symptomatology or perhaps once again kind of unmask a genetic uh, predisposition for the disorder. I'm, I'm not sure that there's any um, direct data on that, but these days a lot of people are talking about it um, as um, I think we talked about earlier, um, what you do with your brain shapes your brain, it shapes brain development, it shapes what pathways will be reinforced and what will not. So there has been an increasing amount of data recently on video game use, primarily among individuals with ADHD, not so much in autism, showing that, um, well there are pros and cons actually, <laughs> showing that uh, some video games can um, can teach kids to focus better, but it also um, very much narrows the range of focus. Um, so I think the jury is out on what the long-term effects are going to be, um, but um, but it's so clear that our access to technology is changing the way our brains develop and um, in ways that we really just do not understand right now, and I think it's something that, that has to be studied uh, quite a bit. I think that um, a lot of times with video game, a lot of time with video games, keeps people away from face-to-face -face contact. And that face-to-face -face contact is essential for developing good social skills. And if kids are spending all of their time staring at a screen and essentially engaging in parallel play, which normally stops in the early toddler years, but now is continuing well into the teens uh, for these kids, that I, I can't imagine that that's, that that's good. Sure. sure. Uh, and I want to hear, but, um, I'm going to take a slightly opposing view. <laughs> um, and I should start off by saying, I don't know how to play Minecraft yet, but <laughs> almost every child that I see is an expert in it. And it, at first, I really wanted to learn, and now I'm kind of afraid. <laughs> um, but I think it's important that when we're looking at uh, things like video games and our concern that they isolate us from other social interactions, we all need time to kick back, to relax, to find our own comfort zone. And if my comfort zone happens to be something that is not socially demanding and does allow me to connect with other people in a way that works with me, um, I think that there needs to be some time during the day that that's acknowledged as an okay thing. And, and Yes, and, and, and it worries me when I hear a parent say that they want to restrict that and to use that as a, uh, a form of punishment. Um, and yeah, I get that uh, we don't want to have somebody spend their entire lives uh, isolated from other people, but I also think it's important to respect that for some people, just like lights can be too loud and voices can be too loud and um, smells can be too loud, uh, that too many people can be too loud too. And it's nice just to be able to have one friend that, is, that doesn't demand that I read their nonverbal cues in order to have a connection with them. So I think it, it has a beneficial purpose as well. 
I don't, these are the brainiacs. I, I feel that I'm inadequate discussing this, but I do like to play video games because I like isolation. And while I know I have to be careful because I'll become too much of an isolationist, I do enjoy playing them. What I've noticed is that it's brought me a group of friends that I can relate to. And so for me, it is not an important part of my life, but something that I do spend a few hours a day doing. However, what does concern me is when I've spent too much time on the video game, my hand hurts, my arthritis is worse, my neck hurts. So physiologically in other areas, the brain aside and the socializing aside, I am a, a sore person at the end of gaming. So I, I think, as my father used to say, everything in moderation is OK. But once we get over to the extremes, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to echo that this, and, and my opinion as someone who pretty much grew up in the mm -hmm. electronic games are taking over our youth generation. Yes, I think we should be cautious about anything that has an impact on on developing brains, but I think that we should also keep in mind, not only is it good to have a situation in which you can unwind away from social activity, we might want to consider whether or not encouraging social activity is actually, in a given situation, having a positive outcome on people all socializing. I mean, if you put me in a situation in which I'm tired and grumpy and just plain frustrated, and you expect me to socialize, not only am I not going to enjoy it, not only are the people who are having to deal with me not going to enjoy it, <laughs> it's just not going to accomplish anything. It's going to be, going to associate socializing with the unpleasant feelings, and we don't want to do, do that. We want to encourage socializing to be a chance that, it, as a, not as something that is, as opposed to being relaxed, but it's something that one can be relaxed and doing at the same time. And that cannot be done by saying, no, get off your ga game, whatever they call them these da days, <laughs> and do whatever it is that people did 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Because we all know that no one actually remembers what, what they did 30 years ago. It was one of those, you know, we were kids, we ran around the block six t times and then we went up. And uh, uh, we, but you didn't have cell phones that could play Minecraft. Of course you didn't do that every afternoon. So how do you know anything? I don't want to say that we should encourage the video game generation to become good addicted to electronics. Even as, a, as someone who spends a lot of their time on the computer, I would say that's a bad thing. But I think that we need to, re, to look at why the ge video game generation is doing that, not just on the spectrum, but just video games in general, and then start worrying about whether or not people are doing it as opposed to socializing, or if this is just another medium. I mean, a lot of the games that the quote, kids these days, unquote, play are social activities of a sort, even if it's not face-to-face -face contact. And I would imagine that has a different effect than if someone was, say, playing Tetris, as far as maybe not, yeah, you're still not learning how to read people's faces, but you have to respond to other people expressing themselves and be able to express yourself to other people, particularly so I would definitely say that it should be looked into more before and uh, judged less. Not so much to this audience as just, OK, so kids are playing a lot of video games. And what exactly is this? Uh, are these effects? Tell, when, when, that, I think, it needs to be addre addressed first. And we can worry about what to do with the fact that it's no, doing things later, because the kids these days ruining their li lives has been a complaint since so we, we crawled out of caves and the, our ancestors are saying, oh, but the kids these days, they're not eating rocks like their grandparents. <laughs> and, you know, do you really want to sound like the people who thought that eating rocks was such a good idea that the fact that kids these days are having things like fire and the wheel that's just wrong. <laughs> I don't think we do. All right, George. Well, th thank you for that. Um, <laughs>
<laughs> so this next one could perhaps be for uh, Cheryl as a provider and, and, and George as a consumer in terms of questions related to sort of insurance coverage, uh, local resources, both in the public and private sector, uh, maybe comment your experiences and, and suggestions for what is available locally. I'll start with that one, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am not an expert in insurance. Um, I do know that uh, I just reviewed legislation uh, that's going to be uh, seen before uh, Sacramento this year uh, as far as increasing some of the expectations for insurance coverage for uh, the diagnosis of autism, which is another reason for me to say, make your voices heard. Mm -hmm. um, local resources, uh, Santa Cruz does not have the luxury uh, that San Jose has, uh, being uh, a much smaller community. Um, so we sometimes do look to San Jose for some of the services that Santa Cruz cannot afford or does not have. Um, uh, I think that Santa Cruz does a pretty good job in many areas of supporting uh, the diagnosis of autism, but I think we also have some major holes in our services. Uh, I th my experience right now is that the schools are working hard to uh, step up to the plate and are probably being um, overwhelmed with the requests at this point uh, as more and more people are being identified. Uh, but the biggest hole that I'm aware of right now is once we hit that graduation from high school, where do we go and how do we support people who have been adequately supported throughout uh, K through 12, uh, and then the funding seems to stop, and the services seem to disintegrate, and um, I think that's a really uh, underserved area, and I'm not sure what our next steps should be, and I would look to uh, all of the audience and, and our panel to say this is a big hole that we need to address. Um, I would like to see, uh, even within this room, people getting together to say, as a group, we would like to uh, have a meeting to talk about this. We would like to have some sort of a consensus. Um, we would like to have some sort of a statement, a written statement, that could represent our community uh, to the larger voices and larger uh, community that would be able to fund these services. So I would think that um, that would be important for us to consider today as a group. But uh, the, I, again, the, I think our most underserved population is the population that is post high school. Yeah. And, and George, your experience in terms of accessing treatment in the community? Well, I don't, it would basically just say yes. It does seem like there's not a lot out there. And a lot of what is steered, and my understanding, and towards people with autism and helping them get jobs is a lot more on the people who are more on the low functioning end, which is understandable and I would not say as a, but as someone who is on the higher functioning end, so what exactly do we do? I can, I'm per, I am described as a smart, thoughtful, et cetera, et cetera person, but because I will, as of reasons related to factors that I don't particularly feel like going into, I was a lousy student. I, high school, I don't, and, and that definitely is an impact. But I don't fall into the category of, let's have this guy pick up tra trash in the parking lot, and I don't fall in the category of, this guy is so fantastically brilliant, let's get him a scholarship. Mm -hmm. yep. Because of said bad performance in high school. So I would say that I think that needs to be addressed. I don't think it's a, as major a problem, but I think it's definitely another hole. We just, it's a, an awkward, okay, these people are perfectly capable of achieving. Why aren't they achieving? And we don't have any good answers. And by we, I mean the uh, people in that category. We, I can say that this is frustrating and tedious, but I can't necessarily say, and if you may, made it in sparkles, that would be different. <laughs> If it was that simple, I would be glad to expound on that, but it's not. So that would be my personal concern. Where do we deal with this if we somehow do manage to have enough of an effort to deliver to the state, okay, 
stop doing whatever it is that you're doing wrong, start funding this. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, next question for, uh, for Dr. Uh, Buchheimer. So if, if indeed there were to sort of um, come to pass that there was a definitive medical intervention for uh, quote unquote eliminating um, uh, ASD, uh, your thoughts about how far off in the future it might be? Would it be looking to address issues um, sort of at the gene expression level or, or correcting connectivity issues? What, what are your sort of looking into the crystal ball of the future? Well, I think in the crystal ball of the future, first of all, I think it's important to note that um, as um, one of my speakers here on the panel has said, if you've seen one case of autism, you've seen one case of autism. Everyone is very, very different from one another, so there's not going to be a single answer to that question. I think that what we're hoping for is to get enough of an understanding of all the contributions and and also to get m tools to measure what is happening dynamically in the brain early in development, and I mean, by early I mean in the first year of life, to be able to look at um, aspects of behavior which might be so subtle that you can't really see them by looking at them, but that we might be able to measure with other tools like imaging or with EEG and, and so forth. And um, uh, it is very unlikely that there's going to be one intervention or two interventions or three interventions, even if we got the medications or, the, or, or gene therapies or something that would affect certain categories of genes. There's not going to be one that's going to work for everybody because everybody has a different genetic background and different pathways that might lead to the same um, outcome. And of course, I think it's important to note that, um, as has been already pointed out, we don't necessarily want to treat all of this either if we start to treat. Um, individual differences and start making everybody identical, that's probably a bad idea. I think that what we'll really be wanting to focus on is trying to intervene for those individuals who are very likely to be in the worst outcome categories at a very early age. So what do I think in the long term? What is our prospect? I think that within the next five years, we will know a great deal about gene expression in the first year of life, probably enough to start creating animal models of intervention. And uh, I hate to be too optimistic, but the field of autism has um, moved forward so quickly um, in the last 20 years due to um, a lot of um, very active parents insisting that Congress start paying for autism research, which they didn't used to do. So you know, perhaps optimistically, in 10 or 15 years, we might have some interventions for some forms of autism um, that, that, might, um, uh, we, that we might be able to use in the first year of life. I think that there's also some good prospects for interventions coming up in the next couple of years um, that will improve certain symptoms in certain individuals. Um, there are new long-acting oxytocin drugs that are coming out right now that I think will particularly be beneficial for that subset of individuals with autism who have um, reward processing deficits um, uh, at, at the neural level. So you know, maybe that's 15% you know, or 20%, but that's a significant number of people who might be um, uh, impacted, and I think those drugs will be ready very, very soon. So I think it's a mixed picture, but I am personally, maybe I'm just an, always an optimist, but I am personally optimistic that we're going to make great progress in the next uh, 5 to 15 years. Thank you. Um, question for the uh, practitioners. Uh, several treatment modalities were addressed this morning. Uh, there was a specific question about biofeedback as a, as a treatment uh, modality. Uh, its use, any uh, data out there on if it's been effective or beneficial in any way? Those practitioners are genius. <laughs> that, that's you, that's you. Um, uh, you know, uh, I recently gave a presentation to a small group of people uh, in the uh, communities, uh, the consumers, uh, with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and that question came out uh, as well. And um, to the best of my understanding, the research is still vague and, un and unclear. There is some robust literature to say that uh, that's that uh, there are some benefits and that we are seeing some impact. Uh, and I think when I look at the drawbacks, uh, the drawbacks are still the questions of generalizability. Um, and in some instances, uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they are finding some generalizability where if you can learn to concentrate or focus or benefit in this area, it will translate. 
But I think the big danger in looking at uh, these sort of biofeedback uh, systems is it's the, uh, the implied notion that it's going to solve many more problems than it solves. Uh, I think if it's targeted to solve the certain problems that it's capable of solving, or when I say problems, I mean uh, aid and development, it probably is efficacious in that regard, but it's never going to help with uh, executive functioning that says, where did I leave my car keys? Um, did I say that out loud instead of keeping it to myself? Um, did I uh, remember to say thank you just now? Uh, those aren't things that probably are gonna benefit, and, and I do worry that uh, some consumers are uh, being convinced that uh, spending a lot of money, a great deal of money, on a service that can help a narrow uh, part of a, of a learning process is being asked to be generalized into too much of an area. And uh, I heard on NPR, I guess that's one of my sources of study, <laughs> um, uh, of a man who had learned, he, he was a journalist, and he went to a convention in which people were having contests about memory. And he surprised himself by actually becoming so good that he won the contest amongst all these people who were champions at remembering. And at the end of this, he realized that there was, he was still not going to remember to take the chicken <laughs> out of the freezer the night before, and he was still not gonna remember all other kinds of things that he needed to remember because memory is more than just one type of memory. Uh, and I think that would be my, my uh, caution about the, the, those systems. Also along the lines of just treatment modality, this one would be for uh, Professor Willie. Uh, I was interested in hearing a little bit more about um, uh, equine-assisted uh, mm -hmm. activities, uh, as well as the work uh, up at Kirkshire Farms. Oh, well thanks for that plug. <laughs> um, I'm on the board of some equine-assisted therapy groups, and uh, it's there that we do the therapy for any age, I mean, as soon as they can you know, pet a horse up through their 90s, we have patients in their 90s who have everything from CP to autism to anxiety disorders to ADHD, you know, everything. And we do find, and there is some good, nice literature out there to support the fact that hippotherapy and, and a lot of therapy with dolphins, of all things, has resulted in speech, has resulted in some muscle movement, extra, uh, muscle movement that wasn't there before. I don't know, maybe you guys do, but I don't know the whys of it so far, but we do see good results. The before and after, the simple t-tests are showing some nice results. So that's very exciting, and I'm, actually I told you I'm writing a book with, with some things on that. In my mind, horses saved my life socially because it was always one of my first pets was a horse, and it was uh, through a horse you can have friends elicited uh, into being a friend because you've said, I have a horse. You imagine how many girls want to be your friend because you have a horse. <laughs> and I think that there was that part, but there was also the responsibility, like you said, learning to remember things. If you didn't have the, the saddle cinch just right, you would fall down. So the reward of riding a horse gives you the motivation to do things, fine motor muscle, big motor muscle, eye hand contact that I normally wouldn't have done, but I was so motivated to ride that I learned those skills. And just, you know, in the past seven years, I learned how to tie my shoe quickly, which seems sort of silly in the age of Velcro and, you know, floppy shoes. But it's, I no longer have to ask a kid to come, you know, lace Mrs. Willie's shoes. I can do it myself pretty darn quick now. So even that little thing has helped me with my, my hand dexterity. Uh, at Kirkshire, it's just my barn. We board 22 horses, and I have my own four horses there. I, I end up rescuing blind horses and pregnant horses, and I have two that I ride regularly. So we don't have those kind of horses there. It takes a certain horse to be a therapeutic horse, certain equipment, certain kinds of instructors. Uh, mine would just be for the kids that need self-esteem or want to learn to ride or want to compete. So it's, I'm, I'm a foot in both doors. Thank you. Um, next question is perhaps coming from a, a, a concerned parent. Uh, what would be sort of the observable uh, factors or behaviors um, that you would see in, in a baby to sort of feel if you know, that child was at risk for um, developing ASD? Um, so um, I have, officially, we're not supposed to do a diagnosis until the age of two. And there are many studies um, currently that are showing that before the age of six months, there aren't any noticeable signs of autism. I personally believe that's probably not the case. It's just that the signs are so subtle and very hard to see. But the first sign that most people will um, point to 
is um, failing to engage in mutual eye gaze with the parent. Um, uh, and as the first year and the second year of life develops failure to engage in joint attention and particularly in initiating joint attention. So that would mean, um, for example, uh, pointing to an object and sharing a gaze with your, uh, with your child about that object. And so, so the two of you together are jointly attending to something. When a child initiates that, look at this mommy. Um, that's a really good sign of health. And the absence of a behavior is often hard to measure, but that's one of the things that you would look for. Another thing is, of course, you know, delayed language development, delayed motor development, irritability, um, and failure to respond to one's name is also a, a, a big one. Um, uh, failure to engage in social smiles, that would be another big one. So those are the, the things that you would look for, particularly in the first year of life. Sure. Did you miss anything? Uh, just a, a few more things, and, and um, I'm, I'm not speaking as a parent because I'm not a parent, um, but um, uh, at, at even very, very young in infancy, uh, there's a sense of that connectedness that we expect uh, a very young baby, a very young baby, to learn to smile when they see a smile, but also to uh, Make, uh, make a contact when they experience a smile, when they see someone else making a smile, that that will uh, direct their attention toward that smiling face. Um, babbling, uh, the absence of babbling is another one of those early cues that we can look for uh, that um, it can be, you know, it's not, it's a, what we would call a, a marker. It's not a definitive diagnostic sign. It's one of those uh, diagnostic markers that say, pay more attention to that. Um, so those would be some of the things that I would add. I'll just add one other or two other things in an experimental test that we do. One is um, we do tests where we create um, uh, an environment where a child could look at a, a person or an animal or could uh, uh, look at an object or a mechanical object that's moving. And if you just look at the eye preference, the gaze preference, um, individuals with autism tend to gaze more at the inanimate object and, and typically developing children, um, and this is true of, of very young children, six months and, and even younger, tend to gaze towards the, um, uh, towards the um, uh, animate, the person or the animal. Um, and the other test that experimentally has turned out to be very successful in um, the baby lab at UCLA um, is, is part of a broader battery where um, the experimenter um, pretends, is playing with a toy hammer and pretends to hit themselves and get hurt. And they say, oh, and they give all the face, you know, pain gestures. And um, we've got some great videos of children with autism. They, they just go on with their business like nothing has happened. But even a very young child, um, six months, eight months old, when they see um, somebody screaming in pain or crying or showing signs of distress will stop what they're doing and they orient and they'll look for their mom and so forth. So it's, it's really an early measure of empathy. I would also add two things, you guys. Isn't there a, a, a lot of studies where kids have a failure to thrive? Like a failure to suckle, failure to connect with their parent. And I, I know with one of my daughters, for example, and this is not just a study of one, but the one that I know, she was very rigid. You couldn't comfort her. She didn't relax in your arms. She was very standoffish and only really wanted attention from one of us. Mm -hmm. And it was a marked difference between that and her sisters. Yeah, uh, and one, one of the things I hear from uh, parents a lot when I'm doing my history, I, as I've learned over the years, I think has a lot more to do with sensory and sensory motor than we have uh, previously considered or appreciated. And when you talk about that whole latching, mm -hmm. there's um, sometimes that oral motor that's delayed, and so we can't make our mouths do those things we want to do. But And there's that stiffening uh, and the crying, the, the really chronic crying. A and I think that when, when we really begin to look more closely in the future, what we're going to see is this this sensory sensitivity doesn't emerge at age five. It's probably there from birth, and we're sometimes overwhelming these little infants with too many close faces, mm -hmm. too much noise, too much touch, the wrong kind of blanket. And I think that a lot of those things will eventually become 
not as problematic when we can say, look, here's three different kinds of blankets to try for your infant. Or swaddling. Or, or swaddling. Yeah, some, some babies want really tight, some want not so tight, some babies like a very light touch, and for other babies that light touch is like fingernails on a blackboard, and helping a parent to recognize which one works and which one doesn't um, is, I think, going to be really oh, important. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I know we've largely avoided the I word and have not talked about immunizations, but there are a number of questions um, sort of uh, asking about exposure to various uh, environmental issues, including prenatal exposure to drugs uh, and alcohol uh, being uh, risk factors or, or triggers. Uh, would anyone want to take on some of those uh, somewhat controversial topics? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck. To, I, I have to have, to have this conversation a lot. <laughs> Um, so with regards to toxins, there have been some epidemiological studies. There's so many toxins in the environment that it's very hard to look at the effect of any one toxin. So there have been some epidemiological studies looking at people who globally are simply exposed to more toxins, people in the Central Valley in uh, California, for example, people who live near freeways. And um, there is some evidence that the incidence of autism is slightly higher among those individuals. Um, it's, it's not a huge effect, but it, it probably is there. Um, but we don't know what they are. The, um, the one um, well-documented environmental, um, I think we can say, contributor, significant contributor to autism is actually age of the father. Um, that is the one validated, well-validated mm -hmm. contributor to increased autism risk. Um, vac the immunization and so forth, the vaccines, um, has, was a, seemed like a perfectly plausible hypothesis um, uh, that has been studied um, very, very extensively and um, with um, many tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars put into um, trying to find uh, mechanisms, evidence, et cetera. There is just simply no evidence um, for um, uh, immunization um, uh, causing uh, autism with the exception of a single disorder, which is a um, genetic accident disorder that can't metabolize certain um, vaccines and it's extremely rare and it should be picked up uh, prior to vaccin uh, vaccination anyway. Um, and uh, that is, seems to be very clear and it turns out the person who um, came up with the initial theory um, was forging his data and had lost his medical license. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, we usually like to take the last 10 minutes or so for sort of for sort of summary comments, uh, words of wisdom to our community, uh, observations, suggestions, and, and maybe we can just sort of go down the row and, um, and start with that as we look to wrap up the, uh, wrap up the day. So you want to kick off? Uh, well, instead of talking about neurobiology, because you're probably all sick of the brain by now, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll just say that um, uh, when I think about uh, genes and autism, I'm reminded of a couple of factors. We, for example, all have genes for the knee, right? We all have a knee gene. There is no variation in our genome in the knee gene, and that's because every human being needs a, a knee, so there's no variation. But whenever we have variation in the genome, then that means that those genes are there for a reason. Um, that means they confer some advantage. So every risk gene that we have for autism is a gene that for some reason is important, that it's good. And I think it's important for us to recognize that I think that we've, in our society, we've increasingly moved towards having narrower and narrower definitions of what is okay behavior. And I think that it's very important for us to recognize that and to leave a lot more room for what used to be called eccentricity. Um, but we now give a diagnostic label to, because those same genes that might in an extreme case um, lead to maybe severe autistic behaviors in, in even slightly less extreme cases lead to um, brilliance in, in, um, in some areas of, of uh, cognitive functioning that are, are absolutely necessary. And so I think that it behooves all of us to appreciate that these behaviors have an adaptive value, and it's important for us to appreciate that. Yeah. Cheryl? I'm stumped. I have no pearls of wisdom. <laughs> um, you know, um, I think that the 
especially this end of the panel has spoken so beautifully today about um, the experience of life of uh, seeing the beauty of life from a different lens. And um, I, I benefit every day when I go to work and I see the world from somebody else's eyes and somebody else's point of view. And uh, so one of the things that I'm trying to do every day in my life is to ask the question of, what, what is it like to be you? What is it really like to be you um, before I s go into my uh, impatience in the grocery line <laughs> or um, my, uh, my uh, sometimes pre the, the prejudices that sneak in in which I say that's not how it should be done uh, and allowing myself to say, what is it like to be you? What do you bring to the table? What am, how am I supposed to see the world from a different point of view? And I, I love my job. I absolutely love my job because in my job, I get to watch the same task being performed by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'm astounded by the creativity that I see and the, uh, the, the different forms of joy. And so I've been asked questions such as, can my child love me? Can my child experience love? Can my child experience happiness? Uh, and my definition of that has so altered, uh, and I no longer uh, start with the premise of a Prince Charming and a glass slipper. Um, and uh, I now realize that for some people, happiness is not the same as it is for me. Uh, and that for some of the people I work with, happiness is, is a taking apart a Lego toy and putting it together in a new way a hundred times. Uh, and, I, and I have come to appreciate the beauty of watching that happen. And uh, so that's something I'm hoping to incorporate more and more into my own life, is just saying, how do I help, help me to see the world from your perspective? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Professor? Oh, I, thought, I was like lost. What am I supposed to say? Um, <laughs> Um, um, uh, as I get older, I request that each and every one of you do something to help we old folks. I think of my dad in his last days in the hospital, and I think of other elderly people, and we were talking a little about sensory things and whatnot. Think of the folks in the nursing home that are uh, complaining about their blanket and kicking it on the floor, complaining about their food and spitting it out, and the folks in the hallway are saying, oh, that's a crotchety old person with dementia, and what they really don't realize is that it was tapioca, and that's a disgusting texture, or it was... Um, <laughs> You know, a, a wool blanket, and, and, and like we said, the sensory issues were involved. And I, I worry that uh, the, those of us that grow up, not only do we not have the services, but our, what does our brain do when we get older? How does it change then? What sort of uh, synaptic responses are no longer answering the call to survival? And what are our, not just, you know, what we can't golf anymore, so we're going to, you know, play shuffleboard. The big issues, the romantic issues, the friendship issues, that we don't know anything. And my publisher recently asked me to do something on the elderly, which I, I'm, I think was a bit of an insult, but um, <laughs> I really don't know, and it scares me. My dad had me, I'll have my daughter, who's gonna have my daughter, you know? And so I wish we paid much more attention to the elderly in general, and I also wish that we did focus more on the females. I have to say that, you know, represent. We, we do know that autism is a spread out among the female pro, uh, population. It is more obvious oftentimes in the males because we uh, explore it in different ways and we show it in different ways and we're far much more subtle. And that ends up in a lot of us with, a lot of the females with some severe comorbid uh, issues. And then so we come to the doctor and we're diagnosed as simply a depressive. Well, that's not the root. The root if it's, uh, you know, a result of self-esteem caused, because what came first, the chicken or the egg, aut autism or uh, depression? <laughs> So I think between the females and the elderly and the minority groups, if we could just capture those three little things, we'd really be uh, on, on the path to something really cool. So that would be my thoughts. George? I think I'm going to say, in the vein of the last comment, maybe it's not. The problem is not that people on the spectrum have trouble communicating. Maybe the problem is that people not on the spectrum have trouble understanding mm -hmm. art communication. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And on the, both for the people here who already are doing it and the people who are not here but are going to be told about the, this, please remember, if, a, if you're not sure if you understood what someone sa said, 
Are you listening to them? I think we need. I think we would all be better off, spectrum or non-spectrum, older, young, minority or not, if people just thought, "Hey, I didn't understand this because I have trouble understanding," rather than this person is just talking fun, mm -hmm. funny. Because yes, people will at times talk funny, but if we have to have to learn, learn how to communicate, other people have to learn how to listen, or no one is going to understand anyone. All right. Well, thank you once again to our to our to our panel members. A uh, couple of sort of quick announcements before we break. Uh, one is please leave your appropriate continuing education forms and suggestions for next year as we exit through the front. Uh, the other is you guys can fight over the bubble bowl that's on your <laughs> table and feel free to take that. Um, but it would be remiss for us to not to give a special thanks to the man behind all this, Mr. George Gero. There's your bubble ball. All right. Well, th I'll see you next year. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. I hope we do bad. more. I know. Well, yeah, thank you. We need more That's voices. Right. Yeah, I really thought that even they should be able to figure out the site. There's like three or four people in that spot. All that people clash. Yeah, I know. That's why it's like how it feels to be dealing with.